we've been doing a series on spiritual warfare. And the reason being is that we live in the last days. Is that there is a war going on, a battle for your soul. People like to write books about battle for your mind, battle for your spirit, battle this, battle that, battle cry. We have combat games. We have honoring the soldiers who have come back. We have all kinds of things that talk about warfare. Oh, what am I eating? It's my Smarties. See, I need to get my Smarties up so that way I get smarter. Because <laughs> I'm fighting spiritual warfare my own way. Sort of. <laughs> but, and I'm sitting cross-legged in a chair. <laughs> That's just the way I sit when I'm, when I feel good. When I don't feel good, well, you know. When I feel better, I sit cross-legged. I don't know. Maybe I'm a hippie. But, in the series that we were doing, we learned about, we're all a vessel. Some of us are like water bottles. We're full of Powerade, coffee, Coke, who knows, liquid refreshment, alcohol. And what we're full of comes out of us. Which only makes sense because whatever goes in you is going to come out. One way or another. It's either going to come out of your mouth or it's going to come out of your rear end. And sometimes you can't tell which is the difference depending on what's coming out of your mouth. For a lot of people, there is no difference. And I say that sadly, not trying to be cute about it. But that really, the cesspool of their conversation is something that no one wants to be around. And so, we need to evaluate what's coming out of our mouth to determine what's in our heart. So if we want to change what's in us, we have to put in what we want because we have become an empty vessel for God to use. So we figured that out, that spiritual worker was kind of like, what do you put in? What are you full of? What do you stick in there? And we figured out that Satan, by way of outside influences, causes us to divide among ourselves so that we would no longer encourage each other and have this strength to resist the devil and have him flee because we're too busy picking off people for him to annihilate. Kind of like a pack of jackals, you know, that go after the herd. You know how they take them out? They run them. They scare them. They make the whole herd get all fearful. Kind of like what we do about the end of the world, or we do like when we're trying to get a revival meeting. Oh, let's scare them to death. Well, sometimes people do that with spiritual warfare. They get them all hyped up, get them all running, get them all excited. And when they get excited, they can't figure out what they're doing because they're so emotionally overloaded, informationally overloaded, that like a pack of jackals, that's what Satan does. He overloads us and makes us run after this or that or the other thing, just terrified, don't know which way to turn. We're like a deer in the headlights and suddenly we're, ah! and then they pounce, wipe us out. Because we're no longer in the herd, we're off by ourselves. So he picks off those that are outside the herd one by one. Because we do it to ourselves too, by way of his other method, which was another tape, of we divide ourselves and split ourselves up and we become smaller and smaller and smaller until Hey, you know what? <laughs> no problem. Pick them off. They're too busy fighting among each other. They never see somebody sneak up behind them and take them out. So in Satan, we also found that most of the time, when we think it's him, it's not. It's us. So he blindsides us by making us think he's the bad guy. So we cast him out and we throw him away and tell him to get out of here and we think we've got some kind of like mystical, magical sword that we can wave around and quote scripture and, you know, hack him and chack him and, you know, attack him and be the wrestler in the cage, you know, and we're going to take him out. So he goes, okay, kill me. So we try and we knock him down and he goes, thank you. Reason being is that once you've cast him out, of somebody, 
whatever your deliverance is or ministry, then he takes off and goes, hey, thank you. I'm going to go get seven of my buddies and we coming back and we going to attack and then there's going to be eight of us. And that situation of the person who's delivered is worse than it was before they got delivered. Relapse. Sort of. Maybe even worse. So we saw a lot of ways of spiritual warfare of what we think we're doing right is wrong. Because we're trying to do it to someone else and we don't see it in ourselves. We don't turn it over to God and let him do the warfare for us. We think we are the ones who are God's army. And the truth is, God has angels to be his army. We're not his army. We're his servants. We were meant to, and we saw that in the last tape, love one another. We were called to love. We were chosen to love. We were peculiarly designed to be a people hard after God's own heart, which is to love as he loved. To be that type of priest that loves. No offense, but if it's a kingdom of priests and a kingdom of kings, who's the soldiers? There aren't any. So, I think somebody got messed up along the way when they think they're supposed to go out and do these things instead of the battle belongs to the Lord and you give it to him and then he takes care of it. So we learn that too. How Satan's got so many deceptions. So many sneaky things. And you know what? His greatest asset is you. <laughs> Doesn't need anybody else to do it. He's got all the powers and principalities and all that out there taking care of the world. It's going its way, you know. It's doing its thing because... He doesn't need to control it. He doesn't need to manipulate it. It's on its way. He started it and it goes. Man, it's, it's like a self-perpetuating snowball. It just rolls downhill. It's going to go downhill because that's what gravity does. It goes downhill, not up. And that's what he started when the corruption came. Everything is wearing down. But God wants us to rise up. So... We learn that. The reality of all this supposed spiritual warfare of attacking and going after some enemy that's mystical, magical out there really is right here between the eyes. It's all a matter of you. What are you going to do? And if you think that you're going to go out and be God's army, <laughs> you're already a casualty. Sorry. You've lost the battle before you even begun. You're going to lose the war if you don't pay attention to what God's Son is saying. One of the chief ways that Satan works in these last days is to bring about one of his most effective tools in our life. And he doesn't have to whisper it in our ear. He doesn't have to throw it out in front of us. He doesn't really have to do anything because he already started it in the garden. And it's been going on since then. And it's a corruption of something that was good. And it's something that we do that's part of our flesh that's not so good. It's compromise. You see, we compromise every day. We go out of our way to say, hey, you know, it's not so bad. Or we compromise when we should have shaved today. Ah, you know, it's, yeah, I'll shave tomorrow. We compromise when the good that we should, we do not, and that which we would not, we do. That our sin is our flesh, so we could have prepared for knowing that we're going to sin and taking care of that ahead of time by staying away from those whom we might stumble with our sin, but instead we compromise we say, oh, it's not so bad. So we compromise on our actions. We compromise in our study. We compromise in the word. We compromise everywhere you look. Matter of fact, the very term God's army is a compromise. Military is a compromise. 
If Jesus said, love your enemies, how do you kill them in order to love them? We compromise. We say, we got to kill the terrorists before the terrorists kill us. Kill or be killed. That's a compromise. Because it's not what Jesus said. <laughs> you, uh, compromise is very simple. And Christians do it all the time. And matter of fact, Christianity today has the biggest challenge in the world before itself because it has compromised the very basic words Jesus said. Jesus said, love your enemies. You know, bless those who just spitefully use you, miserably abuse you, and all this other thing. And we're going, no, that's not what he meant. So we compromise and we make up ways that we could do it. But that's not what he said. Because even if you read it later on, it says, blessed are you if you do these things I say to you. It's kind of hard to compromise. <laughs> and I'm talking about a church that I know very well called Calvary Chapel. It's kind of hard to compromise the Sermon on the Mount when at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, it says to do these things. <laughs> How do you compromise that? Very carefully. <laughs> and there's a lot of Calvary pastors that are going to argue with me about this, which is okay. They compromise. <laughs> they don't even want it. I'm not on it. <laughs> but they do. Because you see, Jesus was taking us out of ourselves on the Sermon on the Mount and telling us what he wants us to do and what he could empower us to do if we were walking in the Spirit as he told us to do. Now, compromise today is simply saying, you know, I live in the world, so I gotta be so worldly partial, you know, I can't, I have to have this world vision of the way it's supposed to be that I can live in this 21st century that, you know, I'm not so heavenly minded, I'm no earthly good. So, if I put Jesus here in the 21st century, I wonder if he was so heavenly minded he's no earthly good and that he wouldn't accomplish much because he took three years out of his life, you know, didn't do a job, so he must have been a worthless bum. Except he was able to, you know, bring up money anytime he needed to. Just go catch a fish, man. I'm going to catch a gold piece. Guess what? Watch this. <laughs> oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> oh, well, there's money. <laughs> Take it and pay my bills. That's not practical. Go get a job. So Jesus demonstrated by his life the reality of his words. He put together facts of what the kingdom of God is. We compromise by trying to make it less than what it is. And Satan laughs at us for our compromise because we deny the power of God and the ability of God to do what God wants to do in us when we lower the standard to measure up to what God never said was the standard. He raised it out of our reach. But he takes us and lifts us up to be in that standard. Yes, there are people that really don't defend themselves. They are a doormat. Ha, come take me. Ha, kill me now, man. Watch this. Heaven opens up. There's Jesus. Oh, man, I'm witnessing to that guy that's, you know, got a gun pointed in my head. Tell the trigger, fool. Ha, I could get you saved right now if you just listen to me. I got the gospel of Jesus Christ. I got the power of the Holy Spirit. You know what? And if I die, then I'm supposed to die because guess what? You can't kill me unless God wants me dead. So guess what? I'm not too worried about what you're going to do to me or my children or my family or whatever. Torture them. Kill them. See what that's going to do. They're going to get you anywhere? Ha. Huh. You think you're going to get ten virgins? Ha. Oh, sorry. Not a hand. Not a chance. You think you're going to get blessed by God? No. You're going to feel guilty. As a matter of fact, you know, I'm going to pray for you right now that God forgives you for killing me, wiping out my children, and devastating my entire life but that God will forgive you anyways and that somehow God will cause salvation because I sure don't want you to go to hell I don't want it on my conscience when I'm in heaven enjoying all the good things that God had in store for me because I planned out my life and I had everything coordinates and I didn't want to ever be caught up into this position of being put into a place where I would judge you according to what you're doing because it was just a momentary lapse of intelligence you know and that somehow you decided that you were going to be somehow worthy of you know going in to kill someone you know and damn them to eternity because you didn't know that you're actually causing a spiritual death, you know, and that you were just killing the body, you know, because the guy was holding a gun on me, you know, so you wanted to stop them from killing you, so you killed them, so guess what, you know, we were all worried about the physical part, because we were worried about the kingdom of heaven, which was spiritual, and we were worried about salvation forever, or damnation eternity, so we went ahead and said, no, don't stop that guy from living, you know, and killing someone, kill him and let him be totally damned. That's what Jesus said. Compromise. 
Capital punishment. Compromise. Violent behavior. Compromise. Military service. Oh, that is the biggest compromise for a Christian. Being a doc, being a football star, being a superstar, being a rock star, being a worship leader. Compromise. If you boil down to and you analyze the reality of where people are coming from and you step it down one by one, then you tell me whether or not God said to you bluntly, physically, verbally, that he wanted you to do what you did. Or rather, by grace, have you gotten away with him allowing you to get what you really wanted to get anyways? Because you see, you could have asked to be a missionary. You could have asked to go and teach. You could have asked to reach the untold masses out there in the entire world of this generation for the salvation that God said, you were created for this purpose. And I designed you in order that you should go out and teach all nations to bring up disciples, to instruct them in righteousness, to make them what? We're going to make them football stars. We're going to give them democracy so that we could show them the worst form of government there is. We're going to give them capitalism so that we could compromise with what God said to do. But, but we're Americans. We want to just give them the American dream, the American way of life. We want them to be Roman. I mean, American. We want them to live like Romans did. I mean, Americans do. We don't want the kingdom of God to be on earth. We want earth to go into the kingdom of God and make it in our image so that we would be comfortable when we get there. Because when we get there, None of us are in charge. We are servants of all. But Jesus said that. But that's not what we say. You see, we demonstrate compromise. We demonstrate to the world that we put people in charge to accept these positions of responsibility, put them high up on a pedestal, make mega churches so that they look like a mega God so that way they can fall into mega temptation and we think that they're not going to fall? We compromise. The end of the world is all about compromise. It has always been that way that God is going to accomplish his purpose irregardless of what Satan does. It's going to happen. Period. There's no doubt about it. So instead, people say, oh, well, you know what? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. God said, they that bless them will be blessed. They that curse them will be cursed. But you know what? I'm going to support Israel, the nation, even when it sells itself to the Antichrist, even when it goes the wrong direction. I'm going to support them, and I'm going to go right down there to Valley of the Ghetto with them. Compromise. Because you take out of context part that you want and you make this Christian Zionism a false religion. We love you, no questions asked, unconditionally we support you. Well, wait a minute now. I love God and I support God unconditionally, but everyone else has conditions. <laughs> uh, I love you, but you know what? If you're going to step into the pit, I ain't going there. The same thing is true about Israel. If the nation is doing wrong, you don't support wrong actions by right scriptures. It's just compromise. That's the problem. So you see, the point is, Satan has gotten so much into Christianity, the compromise lies in ourselves. What do you read yourself? It's not fair, I know. It really isn't. Because if I tell you to just read it without asking a pastor, guess what happens? <laughs> You've got to compromise somehow. Because otherwise, if you don't compromise, you come up with the right conclusions. But if you have someone explain it to you, if they work it just right, of course you compromise. It's 
too hard to live up to. We can't do what Jesus said. We couldn't live like that. We couldn't be the person Jesus told us to be. Compromise. Funny how compromise doesn't sound like lies. But it is. Because the best lie is one that has all kinds of truth with one little degree of turning. Just a slightly off. Just a little added word here or there. And it becomes compromise if we accept it. And the bottom line is the only thing that Satan has to do is just simply leave you alone to figure it out on your own. Because if you don't read it with the power of the Holy Spirit, with God being physically real, emotionally devout, being audibly heard, you will compromise. You will say to yourself, I hear God speak because the Bible says, and it's written, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, so all I have to do is read it. Compromise. You see, Jesus didn't say, my sheep hear my voice and they know me, and then say, read that in order to hear my voice. No. He said, behold, the storms came. Now remember this. The storm is out here. It's not in your Bible. A storm came, and God wasn't in the storm. Lightning came, and God wasn't in the lightning. Thunder came, and God wasn't in the thunder. After all this, God spoke in a still small voice. He didn't write it down. He spoke. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. They will not follow the voice of another. I tell you, your compromise is the unwillingness to find out if God will speak to you audibly in a still small voice. Will he? Or will you compromise? Because you see, there's something important about this. The bottom reality of who God is, is demonstrated by his intervention. Paul didn't say, hey, that light came and it was just like a light I read about in the Bible and I compared it and I made it an analogy and a simile and a metaphor and I was blinded, but that's not, that doesn't count. It was just symbolic. No. God intervened personally. So, since God intervened personally, does he do miracles today? Does he speak today? Does he come physically in the form of Jesus or by his spirit or by some other way today to you? Can he literally appear right now and talk to us? I have the answer, but you're compromised. I know you are <laughs> because it's never happened to you. Has it? Because somewhere you compromise. You settled for less. And that's the big compromise that God doesn't want you to do. That's the big problem in the end of this world. Satan set it all up perfectly. The biggest compromise is you settled for less than what God is. You're settling for less than what God wants. You have become less than what God meant you to be. But I'm a worship leader. Good! Praise the Lord! Have you seen Jesus today? Did he talk to you? You settled for less. You're too busy. My schedule doesn't let me spend hours waiting on the Lord, you know, because you never know when he's going to talk. My schedule and my job, you know, I got all these other priorities I got to do. You know, God doesn't want me to be, you know, negligent. I have to provide for myself. Really. So God was giving an analogy with the prophets. God didn't take care of the disciples. God didn't provide. He's only an idea. Compromise. The biggest thing that God will do is blow your box of what he can't do out of the water. If you ask him to. He'll destroy your ideas of health. He'll destroy your ideas of healing. He'll destroy your ideas of revelation. He will operate outside of your understanding, because he promised he would. 
as high as the heights, the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways above your ways, that they cannot be understood. That you cannot fathom the things that he has planned, that he does, that he knows that he can do. And you don't, because you compromise. We all do it. I compromise in my sin. At times I sin and I go, well, I could be forgiven, so I'm darn it, Lord, you know, can we work on this again, you know, and try to get it right next time, please? Grace, mercy, compromise. Being less than what God wants you to be, lowering the standard, not rising up to God, who he wants to be and reveal himself as, is compromise that the world has done to you and Satan started and you've fallen into that trap. You compromised and you compromised God in doing it because God is no longer what we call in the Old Testament the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. He's a living God. Oh, but, you know, when I pray, I get answers, you know, they got healed, really. They went to a, a certain pastor and minister and got healed, so that's a living God, really. Did you talk to God today? Did you hear him speak? See, you already know you're compromised. You're offering excuses. You compromise and you deal with the lies you tell yourself because you won't go farther. You settled for less and God wants you to never stop seeking him. He wants to be found of those that seek him with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind, with all of their being, with the passion that cries out and says, God, I die except you reveal yourself to me now. I perish except that you speak to me now. God, I listen. Here am I. Speak. Thy servant listens. You compromise. And you know what? It's too bad. It's really too bad. Because you could have so much more. And that's the spiritual warfare. I don't know that you will win in. I don't know how much compromise you have in your life. I was, unfortunately, stupid enough to not be raised in any religion. I was dumb enough to have all these science fiction ideas about beings and aliens and everything else out there, you know, that when I read the Bible, I didn't know how to compromise. I found it fascinating and interesting and didn't know that God was real. And because of how I got saved, he was real. He physically revealed himself to me. He made me feel things I could never feel. He made me see things I never saw before. He made me know things I never knew. He demonstrated things that I could do that, man, it was miraculous everywhere I went. Supernatural. Wow. And it wasn't just in meetings. It was like, no matter who I went to. It was cool. People began to kind of like, you know, not want me around because, you know, I was so humble and quiet. I didn't say a word, you know. I was just like, I was always kind of like inside talking to God and God was talking to me and we were kind of whispering back and forth about the things I was learning. Ooh, it was neat. Then I compromised. See, I'm no different than you. I compromised. But I already experienced those things to be true. And I wrote about them and I kept them and I still tell them because they still happen when I don't compromise. But you see, I won't lie either. I won't lie about who God is. I won't lie about what Jesus does. I won't lie about the reality of a personal living God who can speak right now audibly if you just listen. Can you hear him? Don't compromise. Will you compromise? Will you give in to the spiritual warfare that is trying to keep your ears listening to the worship music? Will you compromise to the spiritual deceptions, not because these men are wrong, 
but that they're teaching you only as far as they've gone and they haven't gone any farther. Will you compromise by adapting to the world or will you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then decide to step out of this world into heaven to hear what God would say to you personally as he would do an Enoch, as he would do a Paul, as he would do for you what he's done to others and take you for a moment into heaven to speak to you so that when you come back to this hell, you can share the reality of God with others. God has an interest in making us righteous. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the working of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, Titus 3.5. The whole new generation of Christians has come up believing that it is possible to accept Christ without forsaking the world. They compromise. They want to put the world into heaven and bring heaven into the world. But what say it the Holy Ghost? You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is at enmity with God? Is it the greatest salesman in the world from Alag Mandino that we become likened unto the world in order to be likened unto God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. James 4.4 Will you compromise that? Go read it. I'll give you time. I'll sit here and wait. Hmm, wonder how they'll try to explain this. Let's see. I gotta earn a living, uh, so I can't be friends with the world and enmity, but you know, I still gotta make a living, so you know, God can't provide for me, so God isn't real, so because God isn't real, because I have to go and earn a living, then I don't have to depend upon God because I'm earning a living by my own sweat and my brow, and that I have to go out and take care of myself and my family and my kids because after all, you know, I can't be so worldly minded that I'm so heavenly good or so heavenly minded I'm no earthly good or so. Wait a minute, I'm completely confused. What did God say in that? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. First John 2.15 and James 4.4 4 says, Know ye not, you adulterers and adulteresses, that the friendship of the world is at enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Huh. Compromise. You can do it. You'll be able to figure out how to get around that one. It's called Compromise. Spiritual warfare, but hey, if you can't win, can't beat them, join them, right? This requires no comment, only obedience. You see, it's cut and dry right there. You're either going to compromise and lie to yourself, or you're going to do it and accept it. It is an error to assume that we can experience justification without Transformation. Justification and regeneration are not the same. They may be thought apart in theology, but they can never be experienced apart in fact. When God declares a man righteous, he instantly sets about him to make him righteous. God is at work both to do and to will of his good pleasure, and he shall present you faultless before the Father with exceeding joy. He who has begun a good work in, in you will complete it unto the day of salvation. The error today is that we do not expect a converted man to be a transformed man. And as a result of this error, our churches are full of substandard Christians. They don't rise to the standard. They have accepted the compromise. They don't become more likened unto the Son of God, who heard his Father speak, who saw his Father do those things in heaven, but they settle for less by compromise. It's easy. Don't get so carried away. Don't, don't, don't get so spiritually minded. You're, you're, you're so one of those Jesus freaks. Don't think you can get there. Don't think you can see heaven. I mean, come on now. You still live here on earth. Compromise. 
Many of these go on day after day assuming that salvation is possible without repentance and that they can find some value in religion without righteousness. A revival is, among other things, a return to the belief that real faith invariably produces holiness of heart and righteousness of life. And if I could tell you, being in this last generation, what it is all about, the warning, if you want to accept this, was, hey, if I want some cold water, I got some cold water. If I want some hot water, I got some hot water. But you, lukewarm, hey, I'll spew you out of my mouth, you compromise. Isn't that what Jesus said? I'd rather you were cold, or I'd rather you were hot. But because you compromise the two, you have not come up to the standard I set. Do you know me? Do you hear me? Are you walking with me? Or are you settling, sitting, and setting on your rear end, doing nothing but compromise? It's easier. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to be anything. All you got to do is compromise.